Okay, now we come to Hadrian's, the balance of Hadrian's reign in um, 1 Peter 1 4. And it turns out that Peter can be just as biting as Paul. Highlighted there in black, <clears throat> translated in English, would be into an inheritance that is imperishable. Um, how do you want to call it? Undefiled and cannot fade away. Except that the last syllable, the last syllable is not counted. That covers the balance of Hadrian's reign until he dies in 138 AD. He dies two years before Aeolia Capitolina is completed. He's the guy that under Bar Kokhba rebellion raised the whole city of Jerusalem, including the temple ruins that were left, and built an entirely new plan of the city on top of it and forbid Jews and presumably Christians to, to enter the city except on the 9th of Ab, which was the anniversary of the destruction under Titus and also the anniversary of destruction um, in J Jeremiah 52, I want to say it's verse 12, of the first temple. That was the only day of the year that the Jews could enter the city to mourn the temple. Now, what's so striking about this is it forms a little satirical commentary specifically on Hadrian that is more, what do you want to call it, nuanced than what Paul did because Paul is just kicking out everything, bam, 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 bam. Peter's kind of slowing it down here. And what's so embarrassing is what he's saying to the reader is he's comparing our inheritance in Christ to what Hadrian essentially inherited. His inheritance is kleronomian, which we saw back up in verse 3 at Ie, for Jesu Christu et Necron. He's, he's drawing parallel to Hadrian's inheritance from Trajan versus our inheritance in Christ. And he's basically comparing it, it's sort of voce, you know, he's trying to, I don't know if you can say he's trying to be nice because it's pretty biting. But anybody alive during that time when Hadrian is ruling would know that this is the passage that governs the time and describes the time. And it's like saying, hi, look what Hadrian got versus what you got. <coughs> because Hadrian's in inheritance was indeed indeed perished because Hadrian perished okay plus the other little kicker here inside this is that under Hadrian the the empire contracted it was it was what he wanted to Hadrian kept traveling around all over his empire but the empire contracted because they couldn't afford Rome had spread itself too thin, it gotten too big, they couldn't they couldn't administer the empire. So what they basically started to do is start to give the territories back to the local kings, okay, and then just keep them as allies. So the inheritance was not imperishable. That's aftharton, the third word highlighted in Greek and black. Okay, aftharton means imperishable, you can't lose it. Okay, it can't die. Yeah, well, but Rome was dying, you know, sort of, by contrast. So the reader watching all this stuff happening to the Roman Empire, learning about it as time passed, he would be recalling this verse and say, oh, look at this. Peter's making a commentary on a future that he wasn't alive to know. Aftharton, that's your inheritance in Christ, but Tharton, hello, is what's happened to Hadrian, what's happened to the Roman Empire. It's perishing, sic transit gloria mundi, okay? And then the next phrase, camianton, see, because that's part of the march, escleronomian, aftharton, camianton, camaranton, see, they would have learned that. Ever since Peter's day, their parents passed on the meter to them. So then they get to the next phrase, kamianton. Miaino means to defile, literally means to 
pour excrement or, or you know, other human waste on the passerby below. Okay, I mean, it's got other connotations too. Okay, well, what got defiled under Hadrian? Hadrian himself got defiled. Okay, this is covering Hadrian's reign, and by that part of the meter, when you get here, okay, see, this is one, two, two, three. I'm having trouble with my mouse, okay? That's the last three years. Well, we'll, we'll say, yeah. Ka, ma, ran, tom. Four. That's the last four years of his life. He starts to go crazy in the last four years of his life. Okay? He starts to go insane, literally insane. He starts demanding that everybody in the Senate be killed and all this other junk. And at the same time realizes that he needs an heir so he had sort of adopted and then finally officially adopted Antoninus who became surnamed Pius okay he had first adopted a, a Commodus a different Commodus from the one we know in history and then when that guy died then he had to adopt Antoninus in earnest okay but the guy was already involved it was Antoninus who kept Hadrian from killing everybody during this time Okay, so that's the last four years, 134, okay? So that you got 133, 132, 130, 129. So from 129, which is just before Bar Kokhba begins. Do you see how witty this is? Just before Bar Kokhba begins, in the meter of Peter, Kamianton. What is going to happen to Jerusalem by the time Neonton is spoken? That's going to be the defilement of Jerusalem and the ruins of the temple. And so while you're seeing Jerusalem defiled, while you're seeing the Jews defile it with their rebellion and the, and the Romans defile it with fighting the Jews, you sit there back like as if you're up on a hill saying, Kamianton. Kamianton, undefiled, my inheritance versus what the land is inheriting right now in front of your eyes. Can this be more clever? Can it be more biting? Because see, Rome owned Jerusalem at that time. That's why they're, gonna, they're fighting against the Jews. That's why they're going to build a city on top of it. But that city is in ruins too. It's built on ruins and it's in ruins. And a whole lot of lives were ruined to get it. It's all defiled. A pig temple is going to be standing there. By the, this time, when this is over, fading away, Jerusalem will have faded away. But your inheritance isn't going to fade away. You see how relevant this is? Could Peter be more... I mean... I don't know, am I getting this across? Am I making sense? I'm totally blown away by how apt this is to future history. How can anybody doubt this is the Word of God? And if I'm not making it clear, yell at me and I'll try to do it again. Signing off. Okay, so now we come to 1 Peter 1, 4b. And what distinguishes this time is this is the time of Antoninus Pius. And again, Peter's astonishing uh, language characterizes the emperor of that time. If you were to look up, for example, in RomanEmperors.org or Wikipedia, what was the empire of like under Antoninus Pius? This would be the key word. It means, it's, it's Greek verb tereo, and it means to guard, to cherish, to hold close, to protect. That's exactly what Pius was all about. That's why they called him Pius. It was a nickname. 
They called him Antoninus Pius. They called him Antoninus Pius because he was guarding the memory of Hadrian, his adopted dad. Okay? He was guarding at Hadrian's bequest two sons, okay, who would become known to history and the, the former guy dies here. Okay, Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius. The condition of, of the accession or the, the adoption of Antoninus Pius was that he, in turn, adopt Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius as his own sons who would take over the empire after him. So he was their guardian. He was also the guardian of all that Hadrian was trying to accomplish. Everything about this guy, when you read about him, is all about him guarding and protecting and cherishing Rome as it was then, you know, extant. He guarded the finances, he guarded the building. He didn't do a whole lot new on his own. What he was doing was protecting and carrying through the policies of our boy Hadrian. Okay, this is considered a golden age of Rome by Roman historians. Okay, the guy ruled 23 years and he dies in 161. And his the, the, the very character of his rule is exhibited by this Greek word highlighted in black, tetteremenen. That's what he was doing, guarding, protecting, cherishing, holding close. That's all the meanings of that word highlighted in Greek. And it's a participle, because like, Peter's using participles to be dramatic. Okay? And then the other thing, enuranios, enuranois eis humas. Okay? He was, he was dedicating temples. He was real big on observation. When his wife dies in 141, he makes a temple to her. He's all about heaven and temples and piety and all the rest of it. This is what Pius was known for. So Peter, getting all this obviously from God, is using this language. Because remember, in Greek, you don't have to put the words in this order. He could have just as easily, okay, put this in this clause here, okay? But in order to track to history future, this is where this clause belongs because it exactly characterizes Antoninus Pius's reign. Is this awesome or what? Okay? That's what he's doing. He was the guardian protector of Rome. That was his whole policy for his administration. Okay, these are the adoptive emperors. And that, of course, is what Paul focuses on because Peter is tying to Paul's Huyotesian text here. Okay. The clause of the inheritance and all that, which, of course, had already started up here. All right, but specifically for Antoninus Pius, this language very much characterizes his reign. And it's a satire also for that same reason because look <clears throat> everything that Antoninus Pius was doing was you know allegedly in the name of the gods okay guarded in heaven all right but they're fake gods okay it's not the real god okay so the Christian who's basically being somewhat persecuted during this time the Christian who is going to look at this and say oh they're fighting, this is what Paul would often say, you know, they're, they're fighting for a perishable, see, Tharton. They're fighting for a perishable inheritance, but our inheritance is imperishable, Tharton. okay, guarded in heaven by God himself for you. So here you are looking at Antoninus Pius being praised by everybody and his brother for his wise leadership and his guarding Rome, guarder and protector of Rome. You know, this is what he was famous for during that time. And the Christian could look at this verse, which is keyed to that, those years, and say, yeah, but my inheritance is guarded in heaven by the real God. Okay? 
and he could pass that on as the message. He could actually explain this text in Greek to somebody wanting to know about the real God and show them right there. See, this is how we know that this Bible that I've got is written by the real God because the guy who wrote this, Peter, was dead by 68 AD. And look at how he's using classical Greek drama, technique, and rhetoric to explain something so prominently true at the very time that his meter indicates. This is exactly the way Greek drama is written. They got, they got million dollar prizes for having such cute phrasing like this. They prided themselves on the sotto voce technique. That's what all the Greek dramatists did when they write their quadrilogies and then they'd have what was like considered like an Olympics for good drama. And you were and you were you given higher marks if you could do some deft thing like this, use just one word to characterize a whole thing. And Greek drama was always about the the your life on earth, how the gods you know, how it's tied to the gods, number one. And number two, Greek drama was about um, a satire on current politics. That all the Greek playwrights wrote like this. Peter obviously knew them very well. He's emulating their style. Okay, this is what Aristophanes would do. This is what, um, what's his face? Um, the guy who wrote Ion, Euripides. This is what Euripides would do. This is the fine, deft, sotto voce technique of Greek drama wording. And Peter's emulating it here. And so you would know, because it's always a commentary on the current politics. Okay, well, what's current? Not the year Peter's writing. This is future. Okay? This is from 138. Okay? 138 to what? Let's see. Ta. Okay, so that's 139, 140, 141, 142, 143, 144, 145, 146, 147, 48, 49, 50, 51 when you round it off. Okay? I mean, it really is syllable 151. Because we got to allow for the two year variance because the BCAD problem. Okay? So, you know, our boy Pius is going to die 10 years after this. But the first 10 years of his reign is characterized by these words. I don't know if it can be more apt. It's just totally astonishing to me. Okay, I didn't expect Peter to be so pointed. Okay, using classical Greek drama sotto voce satire, like Paul did. So, you know, by the time he wrote this, he was Paul's equal in terms of being able to find, finally write, you know, the meter. Maybe he was better than Paul earlier. I don't know. But he's an expert here. And anybody who thinks Peter didn't know is Greek, they're disproved by that text right there in black, if not before. Signing off.